This podcast is a part of the Podmania Podcasting Network. Check out podmania.co.uk to check out more of our great podcasts, features, reviews, match ratings and previews spanning the crazy and diverse world of professional wrestling. What's up everybody and welcome to another episode of Wrestling with Jonners. This is episode 92 and uh, in this episode we're going to be looking at New Japan Pro Wrestling's Wrestle Kingdom 14 Day 2 and of course uh, if you've been uh, keeping up to date with us on social media and through our podcast you know that we dropped our day one recap with Kurt Johansson just a few hours ago but uh, I'm happy to uh, to say that we've got Grizz on the line via Skype to help us cover day two. So uh, Grizz, good afternoon, how are you sir? I'm doing great man, how are you? Yeah, I'm very, very well and uh, happy to have you back on the podcast after the last time. And uh, the last time you were on, uh, not only was it an excellent podcast, but you uh, also uh, shot yourself to the top of the leaderboard for the Brain Buster quiz. And uh, your score of nine has not been beaten so far, sir. So uh, how do you feel about being top of the leaderboard after the first month or so? Well, I uh, just, just wanted to say before we go any further that like, I am going to take a, a kind of um, a page of the, the book of um dave christ i'm gonna start calling myself the golden grizz <laughs> from there on so love it but <laughs> yep, your, so. your score's been hard to beat so uh uh but like I said, we're not hard to test. get <laughs> oh absolutely are you as far and off them answers uh, as quick as i was asking him you were shooting them back at me but uh you did very very well there and uh i wasn't sure whether a score of nine was going to be you know easy to beat or uh hard to beat but you've kept on top of the leaderboard there so uh, i'm not going to test you with the brain buster quiz this week you'll be happy to know you mm. can rest uh, rest easy there but next time we have you on i'm going to see if we can better your score of nine but today Sounds it's good. all about Wrestle Kingdom 14 Day 2. So uh, for those of you that uh, have listened to the Day 1 recap, uh, you probably heard me and Kurt uh, uh, talk at length about some of the matches and some of the highlights, some of the many, many highlights that happened during Wrestle Kingdom 14 Day 1. And we're also talking about, uh, and I want your opinion on this as well, Grizz, the fact that Wrestle Kingdom for the first time ever in its 14-year history is now spread over two days. Uh, Kurt did have his, his concerns that maybe it's uh, you know throwing in some filler matches there. We may have seen a few too many eight-man tag matches in day one which could be considered filler matches although they did serve a purpose of uh, maybe um kind of building uh, championship matches for day two uh, and i think all mm-hmm. the eight-man tags uh, did that and of course we had uh, jushin thunder liger's um first match of his retirement series um to kick off day one but uh, overall kind of the, the two-day uh, concept um do you think it worked or has it worked so far yeah, for the most part, I would say, yeah, it actually did uh, work out quite well because I felt like last year's Wrestle Kingdom seemed very rushed. And despite the fact that, you know, it was about four hours, four and a half, if you cl- uh, include the pre-show, yeah. um, some of the matches seemed very rushed. And, you know, they, they kind of only got to, like, you know, second gear and then they ended. And then you were like, well, that came out of nowhere. Okay. So I think, like, the, the two-day kind of span well that's a lot of wrestling to take in and you know uh technically as a 24-hour period almost yeah. um i feel like it really lets some of the matches breathe a lot more and gives some matches a bit a bit more time that's that's drastically needed sometimes um again like kind of relating this to last year um because obviously the year before that was um wrestle kingdom was about five and a half hours long and you know all the matches got the time that it wanted and it seemed it 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 was a long show, yeah, because you know big big show of the year. Look at WrestleMania; that's long as well. But uh, it it flowed a lot more. But last year, just everything seemed to get kind of um, r- reined in a little and just didn't get the time it deserved. So two days, yeah, I'm I'm happy with this, and uh, I'd say keep going with it. 
Yeah, no, I totally agree. I, I do believe that to know, agree with your sentiments that it did allow some of the matches to breathe. Uh, even the, like I say, the, the filler matches, the eight man tags, they did uh, kind of allow to kind of extend some of the storylines that were going there, feeding into day two, some of the championship matches. Um, but uh, no, I, I think that overall it was a, a massive, massive success. Uh, do, do you think that it's something that uh, Vince McMahon and company could possibly consider for, for WrestleMania? So, I mean, I, I, I've been to a WrestleMania and, and Boy, was it a long show. Uh, you know, you've got people out there for an entire week, uh, possibly spreading a big show like WrestleMania over two days would have a, a similar positive effect. What do you think? That's always been kind of something that's kind of been in the, the rumour mills of, oh, WrestleMania might turn into a two-day event. And once again, why not? Like, there's... You, you see a lot of, like, kind of feuds that happen on TV around WrestleMania season that just don't make WrestleMania. Yeah. And then... There's some matches that you would argue would should probably be in WrestleMania, which end up not being. So that way, with a two a two day WrestleMania um, show, what like why not? Like it, you know, you're you're if you're a company like WWE who you know enjoys money, um, Saudi Arabia. Uh, so why not? Like you could get two essentially two paydays, uh, two WrestleMania paydays yeah. by having it Saturday Sunday. Yeah, and, and this is something that New Japan uh, definitely benefited from because over the course of the two days in the Tokyo Dome, they had, had 40,000 on day one on Saturday morning. Uh, they, they had 30,000 on, on day two, so 70,000 over two days. I mean, when you think about it, WWE would normally do 70,000 in a single day for WrestleMania. Potentially, they could they could have well over 100,000 combined over a two-day period. And not only that, I mean, the WrestleMania I attended in New Orleans 2018, there must have been including the the, the the kickoff matches, the pre-show matches, maybe 14 matches in total. Spread yeah. them over two days, give the matches time to breathe. I think one of the common complaints about WWE is you have all these uh, fantastic matches, great individuals, lots of hype behind them, lots of storyline build on TV, and then they get maybe a 10-minute match on a big card like WrestleMania purely because they they know they're running out of time after the first few matches. Absolutely. It's yeah, yeah. Uh, when you sit down and watch things like WrestleMania now, like you know that that's going to be like that is a solid, you know, quarter of your day, like, yeah. and even sometimes longer than that. And that's yeah. just the main show. Like, if you if you're like me and you need to watch absolutely everything because you know you're OCD in that way, um, uh, you're sitting there at ten o'clock watching the pre-show, watching those uh, pre-show matches and everything. So. We were talking about like upwards of seven hours that we're sitting there watching WrestleMania. Yeah, and, and like I say, going back to Wrestle Kingdom because of course we're here to talk about New Japan. Both days, both shows, probably talking three and a half, four hours. Both days, both manageable lengths of time. The matches did have time to breathe, and I found that they were two very, very enjoyable days of wrestling. So let's get stuck into it then. Um, obviously, you know, there, there's going to be some highlights uh, during. during uh, the course of this chat and some low lights as well one low light in particular that we'll kind of touch on now if you if, if we can Grizz is the very final match of Jushin Thunder Liger's career so a 30 year plus career um, and of course we're going to be talking about Jushin Thunder Liger in the opening match of day two but uh, what what does Jushin, Jushin Thunder Liger meant to you as, as a wrestling fan uh, we know that you're a, a new Japan and a Japanese wrestling fan you've probably seen a fair few of his matches on TV over the years uh what will it mean to you with it with it, him uh, kind of bowing out and and retiring from the support that he's been from the sport he's been a big part of for over 30 years uh well let's just start off by saying bona fide legend yeah yeah, and uh, I mean, Kurt Johansson in the day one uh, recap said that uh, with the exception of Rey Mysterio, possibly the greatest junior heavyweight ever. Um, and uh, I think he's spot on with that most definitely, um, oh, if yeah. not the greatest. Um, so th that, that leads us nicely into the first match of uh, Wrestle Kingdom 14 day two and it was uh, Royo Lee the current uh, Ring of Honor world television champion teaming up with the time bomb Hiromu Takahashi uh, the brand new IWGP junior heavyweight champion after defeating Will Ospreay on night one remember and uh, going up against uh, Sano and uh, Jushin Thunder Liger and they had a corner man in the shape of Fujiwara uh, so Fujiwara the, the inventor of the uh, of the famed Fujiwara armbar uh, he did get a chance to kind of perform his legendary move in this match but uh, he was cornering the two legends of Sano and Liger so uh, now 
yesterday Takahashi defeated Will Ospreay as I mentioned that epic match to win the junior heavyweight title and tonight he is an opponent in the final ever match of Jushin Thunder Liger uh, and of course you can't forget it's Royal Lee and uh, Hiromu uh, Takahashi uh, they've had their battles in the past as well but tonight they have to put all their battles and differences aside to team up in this very important retirement match to kick things off uh, so the match starts with Liger and Hiromu in the ring with an exchange of moves including a surfboard a bow and arrow and a Hiromu special from Liger so lots of uh, really cool moves that Liger's pulling out uh, uh, that are typical to him as well however Liger goes uh, for the tag and when he does so both Lee and Takahashi they rush into the ring they knock Sano off the side of the ring uh, then double team Liger to massive boos from the Tokyo Dome uh, faithful uh, the match uh, wasn't a, uh, a gentle retirement match by any stretch of the imagination for, for Liger for those of you that, that, that might have thought that it would be kind of a, a gentle match for him um, all four knocking lumps out of one another uh, the match does eventually come to an end with the IWGP junior heavyweight champion drop in Liger with a tiger bomb for the one, two, three. And there we have it. And I suppose this is the way it's meant to happen uh, with the legends going out the right way, putting the current stars over uh, on the way out. So uh, this was a fun match to, to uh, kick day two off. Um, but for the second night in a row, Jushin Thunder Liger's taken the pin, Grizz. Uh, but I suppose, as I mentioned, you know, this is this is the way it's done in professional wrestling. This is certainly the way it's done in Japanese professional wrestling with the legends uh, putting the, the younger talent or the newer stars over on the way out, doing things the right way. But uh, what were your thoughts on what went down in this opener then, Grizz? I mean, <clears throat> yeah, you, you kind of hit the nail on the head there by saying that that is definitely the the kind of Japanese style is if you're you're going to bow out, may as well bow out on your back. Yeah. But I just can't help but feel like when this match ended, there was a lot of air that kind of got sucked out of the Tokyo Dome there. Okay. And just maybe it might not have been the right idea. I mean, Hiromu Takahashi taking the, the pinfall was absolutely... If you if you were going to have Liger lose, um, Takahashi is definitely the uh, the person to take take the fall because obviously he's just, you know, back recently from his massive neck injury. And so getting the, the bump of pinning Liger on his last ever um, match is good. But at the same time, it just can't help but feel... As if, you know, Liger should have just maybe went out on top. Yeah. Yeah, no, agreed. But uh, like you say, the, the atmosphere in the, in the building did, did change a little bit after this match. Um, but uh, like I say, uh, Liger obviously went out the way he wanted to go out, I believe. And uh, I wouldn't be surprised if he was heavily involved in the booking of these matches. Um, but uh, I think more than anything, he'll be remembered for 30 amazing years of professional wrestling. And uh, yeah, I mean, he, he's graced pretty much every promotion around the world. He, he's been to the UK more times than you you can shake a stick out and perform oh, yeah. for quite a few promotions around the UK. Got uh, that... live once or twice. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And uh, like I say, he, he didn't really grace the ring of WWF or WWE. There was that one time uh, yes. when he was at uh, NXT TakeOver New York and he had yep. that uh, tremendous match against Tyler Fantastic Breeze. And that's probably match. a match, match that Tyler Breeze will probably remember for the rest of his life. A real honour to uh, wrestle uh, a legend in his only match in a WWE ring. Um, but uh, yeah, a best of luck to uh, Jushin Thunder Liger with whatever he decides to pursue um, after professional wrestling. Uh, then on to the next match, and it was for the junior heavyweight tag titles. Uh, Sho and Yo from Rapungi 3K versus Ishimori and El Phantasmo, part of the Bullet Club, of course. Now, this was uh, this match happened uh, just as my feed uh, for New Japan World decided to play up for about half an hour. So I was trying yeah. to find various alternatives uh, to watch this match, which I did eventually. Um, but I uh, did manage to catch a feed, uh, and it was uh, Yo and Sho of Rapungi 3K that managed to uh, win the match and win the junior heavyweight tag titles in the process. And they finished the match with a, a double foot stomp and a package pile driver combo for the win. Uh, did you manage to catch uh, this uh, junior heavyweight tag title match, uh, Grizz? And if so, what did you think about it? Um, I, I missed the end of it, actually, but uh, from what I did see of it, like, I'm, uh, very enjoyable. Like, Sho and Yo are um, two of my boys, so yeah. uh, absolutely love those guys. Um, uh, so, you know, and that they're involved in, I'm, I'm happy with. I'm just um, a bit uh, kind of gutted that I missed the finish, but absolutely ecstatic to hear, you know, once again, junior heavyweight tag team champions. 
Yeah, yeah, definitely. Uh, good, good day for them, definitely. Uh, and then we have one of the most hotly anticipated matches from day two. Zack Sabre Jr. going up against Sonata. Uh, so this is for the Rev Pro British Heavyweight Championship. Now, coming into this match, Sonata um, has four wins over Zack Sabre Jr. in the last 12 months. They said on commentary, with most of those coming from tag matches. In singles competition, Zack Sabre Jr. and Sonata are two and two before their match here at Wrestle Kingdom 14. So this was a, a very hard hitting, quite a tech technical matchup between these bitter rivals, you could say. Uh, there were so many transitions, so many counters, so many pinfall attempts in this one. Uh, the match was a lot of fun with Sabre Jr. getting the better of Sonata for the win to retain his Rev Pro British Heavyweight Championship. Uh, this, this was a good match uh, and a really, uh, I, I'm really enjoying the development of Zack Sabre Jr.'s character and confidence. Uh, certainly behind the microphone, we know that he's uh, amazing, one of the best in the world inside the ring, but I think his character has certainly developed. He's come along so much in, in his confidence, the way he kind of delivers himself um, as, as an individual um, he's definitely turned into one of the more entertaining acts in New Japan uh, certainly uh, through 2019 into 2020 but what were your thoughts on Zack Sabre Jr and Sonada and uh, I mean do, do you kind of echo my sentiments on Zack Sabre Jr that I think he's turning into quite an all-round package not just in the ring but on the mic as well definitely like um, I love the way that Rev Pro, the company just almost seems to be like a continuation of the way that uh, New Japan's booking. And there, you know, there's feuds and all that that kind of pour into Rev Pro and then kind of pour back into New Japan and all that. Yeah. I really like the two of them working together. And it's, it's very unique in this kind of, you know, um, landscape where almost every company kind of worked under the WWE umbrella. But as you say, yeah, um, Zack Sabre Jr. is just really started to come into his own over the past few years and it's really kind of built up to this point um i got to see him versus okada a couple of years ago um in manchester where he actually pinned okada wow. and yeah like uh, you, we, we spoke a couple of minutes ago about the air getting sucked out the room when liger lost imagine what it was like when um the three count hit and okada lost that match everybody just <laughs> like we, we were like, uh, <laughs> like absolutely completely no. unexpected i'm sure yeah oh yeah but um I, I just wanted to to pimp that out because i got to see that one live <laughs> um yeah. but that i mean you know saying that though also like that was kind of the start of the rise of uh, zach saber jr um when you when you really think about it like that was that was the biggest win of his career at that point and it's kind of just kind of went on from there and you know multi-time rev pro champion constant matches with uh tanahashi and all all the likes of that like so he's he's definitely getting up there and you know he's, he's had matches against wakara for the the um iwgp title he's won the new japan cup he's he's pretty much doing everything i wouldn't be surprised if maybe maybe this year or potentially next year i wouldn't be surprised if he wins the whole g1 yeah yeah i think he's definitely going to be a contender the way they're pushing him anyway i mean this is the second wrestle kingdom where he's been able to uh pull off a a, a singles victory um so uh you know when you look at uh, the other british talent they're pushing in japan will osprey alongside zach saber jr they're definitely behind they can they, they've got some special talents there and they know they've got some special talents in there uh, doing the right thing by pushing them the right way but um uh, speaking of special talents the next match John Moxley versus Juice Robinson so Robinson uh, was victorious the night before when uh, himself and his partner uh, David Finley managed to win the, the heavyweight tag team gold um, from uh, Gorillas of Destiny John Moxley managed to regain his United States uh, IWGP belt uh, the night before as well over Lance Archer. And, and this is uh, kind of a match that's been building. They've had a bit of a rivalry through 2019, especially where Moxley beat Juice Robinson for the United States Championship. And here they are, Wrestle Kingdom 14. Uh, the stage is set. Uh, what were your thoughts going into this one? I mean, you probably saw their matches from the night before, especially that brutal match that John Moxley had with Lance Archer, which uh, was was... One of my favourite matches of the night from from night one. But uh, going into this one, Juice versus Moxley, uh, what were your thoughts and expectations? Well, there was also the added uh, caveat that they, they mentioned on commentary about um, Juice Robinson uh, defeating... Uh, oh, God, it was a bit called him Dean Ambrose. Uh, John Moxley and um, the, the G1 Climax. And that was the 
the pivotal loss to Moxley's record that stopped him from essentially advancing in the the G1. So there was a you know there was a lot behind this. There was a lot from like both um, both camps. Um, so going into it, um, it was it definitely had quite the the big fight feel. It really did, yeah. And uh, they didn't they didn't. Uh fail to deliver so this match started on the outside with juice uh, definitely the aggressor to start off with dropping moxley throat first across the guard railing moxley then gathers some chairs from underneath the ring but it's juice who nails moxley with a cannibal moxley uh, was kind of placed in onto one of these chairs in a seated position at the time gets nailed with a cannibal at ringside uh, both men have been through uh, a war of their own over the last uh, 24 hours as i mentioned especially when you consider the punishment that juice robinson took uh, in the in the tag title match uh, when him and his partner david findley they, they won the tag titles the night before but uh, robinson was definitely suffering from that backdrop that he took on the ramp prior to the match starting on night one uh, juice however gets a, a two count from a power bomb he gets another two count from a suplex and a jackhammer combo. Uh, both wrestlers take turns in nailing one another with German suplexes, brutal German suplexes. Uh, Moxley eventually transitions into the, the Death Rider uh, for the win to retain his US Heavyweight Championship. So uh, Moxley shouts out to the camera that he, he, he owns uh, Wrestle Kingdom, but before Mox could uh, could really take in the win and, and celebrate the win, uh, he sh- cut short with the music of Minoru Suzuki, the toughest hardest uh-huh. bastard there is uh, there, there's this moment Grizz where we all thought we were going to get this impromptu dream match between these two uh, tough no nonsense hard hitting uh, wrestlers but instead uh, of getting the match Suzuki drops Moxley with a, a gotch style pile driver uh, before standing over Moxley with the US Championship belt held high above his head so it looks like that's the ne- that, that's setting up perfectly the next feud for John Moxley uh, the next time there's a, a big show in New Japan but uh, t- give us your thoughts on, on the match and then uh, what transpired afterwards with um, with Minoru Suzuki coming out nobody was expecting him to be there and certainly nobody expected what, what was very nearly an impromptu match but we just got a, a beat down at the end but uh, give us your your, uh, your thoughts on this one I mean the the, the match was was great but uh, I mean as as you're kind of saying the the main kind of talking point we have here is the aftermath and yeah. as you were as you were saying uh, the way that we thought we were going to get an impromptu uh, match between the two of them and li- literally um i was sitting there with uh with my bud while we were watching it i was like oh my god like he's a, he's in his wrestling gear moxley's not going anywhere there's a referee in the ring are we getting it are we getting it right now are we doing this are we doing this and then they started fighting then the bell went and it was like <gasps> and it was like oh no way it's the it's the bell but the then the bell bell when, carried on ringing yeah uh, to say look stop what you're doing now but the fans thought we were going to get a bell. match i yeah, I mean, it would have it would have been perfect to have given us that that impromptu match. You can see the headlines, uh, but uh, I think they're they're keeping us kind of hooked in their uh, bated breath and uh, kind of uh, for us to all anticipate the eventual match between Moxley and Suzuki uh, sometime down the road in 2020. But uh, yeah, that was one of the highlights of the night for me. The match was good, but when that kind of face to face that encounter happened, uh, yeah, I was I was there, hook line and sinker. Uh, I mean, you but see, you um, can see how much of a Minoru what? fan I, I, I am by just looking at my uh, escape photo. Oh, oh, I've not caught it yet. It's uh, Minoru surrounded by, uh, you know, three absolute babes, Kari ah, Sane, Io Shirai, oh, yes. and Mayu. Of course, it's staring me in the face. Yes, that is <laughs> Minoru. It's a very small picture at the corner of my laptop, but uh, yes, good man, good man. Uh, but uh, let's have a little talk about the next match. It was for the IWGP Never Openweight Championship. Uh, Hiroshi Goto versus current champion going into the match, uh, Kenta. Uh, so this was another battle between these two veterans of the business and a really back and forth match. Uh, Goto manages to drop Kenta with uh, Anushi Goroshi. Uh, Kenta strikes back with a, a, a draping DDT and a drop kick into the, into the corner um, with, with Kenta very nearly winning the match with his psycho knee or I suppose the, the running knee um, there's a series of stiff palm strokes from both men and another close near fall from Goto's uh, GTW however the match came to an end in a in, in quite dramatic fashion with Goto getting a pinfall with his GTR once again becoming the new IWGP never open weight champion uh, and this very very stiff 
hard hitting, uh, sometimes hard to watch championship match. So Kenta no longer the uh, never open weight uh, champion. That leaves him to kind of pursue other challenges, which we'll talk about a bit later on. Goto is mm. the new never open weight champion. Uh, but to give us your kind of uh, uh, two cents worth on this one, then Grizz, uh, did you enjoy this one? Oh yeah, it was. Uh, just see any match that has the 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 never open weight title on the line. It never really fails to be appealing. Just yeah. because the the never open weight concept obviously is it's it's open weight anybody from any weight class and so that that means there's there's tons of different styles but when you think of it never uh, the the never open weight title you you'd think of people like Tomohiro Ishii Goto obviously very recently Kenta all really big bruisers and Kota Ibushi as well obviously like big. Um, big bruisers that were just like you know clubbing each other and just like the the epitome of strong style so just you know a, any never open weight title match is always an instant classic and this definitely ended up being one of them fantastic yeah. stuff yeah it really was it will it was one of them uh, matches where you winced uh, every time they uh, they struck one another it certainly was a, a very hard hitting match uh, i think we're going to be talking a little bit more about kenta later on in the podcast but uh, leading slightly nicely to the next match jay white and Coach Ibushi. Now, remember, these two were defeated in their matches from day one in the, uh, uh, the double gold dash matches. And of course, Jay White lost uh, his Intercontinental Championship, and uh, Coach Ibushi uh, was un- unsuccessful against uh, Okada in the main event of day one. But here they face one another. That there's a very scary spot at the top of the match where White sends Ibushi off the ring apron, face first or possibly neck first into the guard railing before throwing Ibushi again into the guard railing chest first uh so not not a fantastic first uh, minute or two for abushi in the in the start of this match abushi respond does respond with a, a snap runner followed by a tope um over the top rope onto white on the outside um in his main event championship match on night one with okada abushi took an, a ton of punishment an awful lot of punishment especially to the neck and the head during that match so he's probably uh, probably about 50% during this match, I would say. Abushi drops white with with the bastard driver, but uh, Abushi is just too beaten uh, to make the cover on this occasion. Abushi gets into like a, his trance-like state when uh, t- towards the end of the match, where he's uh, kind of in the zone essentially, and he's able to take any amount of punishment that thro- uh, White throws at him with uh, Abushi nailing Jay White with some really solid and stiff forearms and a wicked clothesline. Uh, white hits uh, an avalanche uh, Uranagi from the top rope that looks pretty painful then jay white throws your throws abushi into the ref sending the official to the outside gado then comes in with a steel chair but abushi knocks him clean out of the ring before delivering the last ride uh power bomb on white for a visual pinfall but of course no referee still out on the floor on the outside abushi grabs the official brings him back into the ring uh, just in time uh, to count what should have been a three count from a knee strike. However, Gado pulls the referee out of the ring to prevent the count once again. Uh, White throws uh, the steel chair that's in the ring directly into the face of Ibushi with force. Uh, Gado throws Ibushi, um, and just nails Ibushi with a foreign object, uh, possibly some brass knucks or something like that wrapped around his hand. I think it was, White- yeah. Yeah, White delivers a straight jacket, a bloody Sunday, and a Blade Runner for the eventual pinfall over Kota Ibushi. So this was a well-booked match. Um, a fair bit of interference. Sometimes I don't mind that as long as it's you know beneficial to the storyline. Ibushi looked as if he'd had uh, you know the match at one the match one at one stage, uh, especially when he was kind of in that um, in that in that zone and really taking all the punishment and just nailing White with some stiff forearms. Uh, but the craftiness of White and Gado won the match in the end and Kota Ibushi has taken more punishment than I've seen one man take in a 24 hour period certainly with his two matches and Ibushi needs to take a long holiday after Wrestle Kingdom uh, so this was a very enjoyable match uh, unfortunately Kota Ibushi is, is zero for two in his two matches over Wrestle Kingdom uh, Jay White uh, did pick up the victory by nefarious means here against Kota Ibushi but uh, I'd love to know your thoughts on this one it was uh, quite an enjoyable match yeah, it definitely seemed almost a bit like uh, desperation for uh, Jay White um, with the, the amount of uh, in, uh, <clears throat> interference and, you know, underhanded tactics. Uh, but the, the the kind of interesting thing that I think is coming at this match is obviously going to be the state of mind of Kota Ibushi. Yeah. Uh, obviously, we kind of seen uh, yesterday at the main event of uh, Wrestle Kingdom uh, night one when he was against uh, Okada and he kind of uh, you know he he, he kind of went about 
OTT to the point where like uh, some of the some of the crowd actually started to boo him, him his yeah his uh, pummeling of Okada and uh, we seen it again in this match where uh, you know there was especially that point where um, Ghetto uh, hit uh, Kota with the the chair and he kind of winced and it was like. And then just done the the deadpan face. It's like, yeah, that's that's not a face that you want to be face to face with. Yeah. Um, and then he got a heart punch for his troubles. But this is this is the, this is the interesting point. Is it, I'm interested to see what comes out of this in terms of Okada. Uh, sorry, um, in terms of um, Kota, because it's looking as if he may be turning heel. Um, and it might be like a you know a, a prolonged heel turn that might start coming you know obviously from the frustration of losing two massive matches uh, at the Tokyo Dome two nights in a row, yeah. even you know throwing kayfabe aside and all that like that's that's a hard pill to swallow. And yeah. also, as I says, the way that like Jay White seemed so desperate to at least uh, you know kind of get at least a win after losing the night before um so th- the desperateness of of him using all the interference to try and win and he he ends up you know with a one and one record at least for this weekend obviously not including any other wrestle kingdoms but kota with a zero and two is uh must be you know eating away at him and i think uh he might you know turn to desperate measures to maybe try and get himself back up to the the top of the 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 rankings are for lack of a better term yeah and i think i think if if new japan play this right and kind of make this more of a prolonged slow heel turn this could be a really really good story and especially with koto abushi he's, he's, he's one of the beloved uh wrestlers in new japan he, he's been a beloved wrestler throughout of japanese wrestling for many years now and um, i think this is a really good opportunity for them to have a bit of a slow build a slow heel turn um because i think you know he's still considered a baby face despite the fact that he did get some booze against okada on saturday um but but um, yeah, I, I, I think that this, it's, this is one of the more interesting talking points coming out of Wrestle Kingdom is, is Ibushi. And uh, like I say, he did get some booze on Saturday night. He did have that same kind of very stoic uh, kind of trance like state where he took the punishment and then it was, was like yeah tunnel vision and he really battered jay white to the point where jay white uh looked pretty pretty intimidated by abushi when he was in that state of mind and that could be something going forward they could really capitalize on um so it'll be interesting to see how they develop uh kota abushi coming out of wrestlemania uh from these two days but uh now we lead it in nicely to a match that both you and i have been looking forward to and it's uh the pain maker yes. Le champion chris jericho returning to new japan um and uh, taking on uh, Tanahashi now he's, he's had his uh, kind of uh, moments with Tanahashi at various New Japan shows in 2019 which has all led to this kind of uh, feud, this blow off match between the two of them, uh, no championships on the line although there was kind of a, an unofficial condition added to this match uh, laid down by Chris Jericho earlier on in the week where he said that if Tanahashi can defeat himself uh, Jericho then he will gain access to the Forbidden Portal and have a, a shot at Jericho's AEW World Championship so this has kind of set a lot of tongues wagging online as to whether there's a working relationship between AEW and New Japan um, some say there could be something in the offing especially with Moxley being heavily involved in both promotions uh, whilst being signed with AEW of course and being Absolutely. currently the uh, uh, IWGP United States Heavyweight Champion so there, there, there might be kind of something uh in the future i don't think there's anything uh, been been signed um in blood just yet between the two groups but it would be interesting to see if all could be forgiven uh from new japan of course they lost so many uh big names at the start of 2019 with the bucks and hangman page and and uh, 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 uh Kenny Omega leave in New Japan all at the same time. Um, but I, I, I'm happy to say that New Japan have, have recovered nicely um, and uh, are not missing them so much. But do you think potentially down the line there could be this working relationship between New Japan and the AEW, especially with what's gone down over this weekend? Well, yeah. The, uh, me and uh, me and my brother was watching um, Rest Kingdom with uh, today. We'll agree. We kind of like broke this down. Um uh, in quite a lot of ways, and especially considering, like, as you says, like, you know, uh, Moxley ended the weekend still United States champion, and 
I was kind of thinking that maybe they might have gave him the belt on the Saturday for him to drop it on the Sunday if this was meant to be, you know, his last hurrah in um, New Japan. But obviously it seems as if uh, Moxley's going to be there for at least the the foreseeable future. Mm. And the fact that, you know, Jericho came out with the AEW title as well, like, that's not a decision that he gets to make. That's obviously going to be the higher-ups at AEW. Um so they've obviously gave him the the go ahead to do so, and the the way that obviously with the build up and all that and the oh well uh, Tanahashi if you beat me you'll get a future title match, and and all that jazz like it definitely seems as if like there might be something that's maybe they're putting something in place because I don't know if the ROH deal with New Japan is still a thing or not, and maybe they're just trying to you know run that out, but uh, I feel as if. AEW in New Japan, you know, um, becoming a be- becoming a team and you know, people from AEW going back and forth in New Japan and vice versa could uh, be nothing but good. Yeah, definitely, especially with New Japan looking to expand and uh, have more regular shows in the US and setting up uh, New Japan America as well. Uh, maybe they're, they're looking for somewhere on kind of American soil or a company on American soil to to help with the groundwork for that and maybe uh, a relationship with AEW won't be a bad thing but um, we shall see what happens Uh, I'm sure all will become apparent very very soon Uh, in this match Jericho versus Tanahashi though there's some fun mind games uh, being shared between these two in the early stages Uh, the the match goes to the outside where Jericho dumps Tanahashi over the railings and onto the announce table setting uh, Tanahashi up for a brutal DDT on the announce table Uh, now uh, this was uh, a slower style match uh, compared to some of the others that we've seen over the last two days at Wrestle Kingdom which to be honest with you made for a refreshing change Uh, there's been so many blistering fast paced matches that we've seen that having a slower paced match uh, was certainly good in my opinion uh, Jericho pulls the referee into the path of the charge in Tanahashi before Jericho whips Tanahashi with his weightlifting belt uh, Tana connects with a, a massive crossbody off the top turnbuckle down onto the floor on the outside that was a pretty cool spot uh, Tanahashi works over Jericho's knee during this match as well which comes into play when Jericho is unable to capitalize after hitting a lion salt Jericho misses his Judas effect, uh, spinning back elbow with uh, Tanahashi delivering a uh, a code breaker of his own, followed by a sling blade for a two count. Then Tanahashi goes for a flying cross body once more, uh, but this time Jericho is able to roll through on the move and then apply the uh, the lion tamer for a second time, uh, with uh, Jericho pulling back even further, giving Tanahashi no other option but to tap out to Le Champion, giving uh, Chris Jericho his first Wrestle Kingdom victory. Um, So uh, this was a, a, a really well booked match like I say a slower pace a different pace uh, match to what we've seen certainly in day one and day two of Wrestle Kingdom I thoroughly enjoyed this one uh, what about yourself I know you're a big Chris Jericho fan um, you love the fact that he's kind of on uh, you know New Japan card a Wrestle, Wrestle Kingdom card um, but uh, how did it sit with you when you're watching it over your bowl of cornflakes this morning then Grizz <laughs> Um, well, it was, it was more a can of cider, but <laughs> <laughs> so, you know the Scottish do Scottish well, don't we? Um, <laughs> but oh yeah, absolutely. Sip of cider for the working man. Um, I, I'm not gonna lie. Like uh, we've uh, we've established how much I, I love Chris Jericho after um, you know the last time I was on the show, uh, but even even after all that. I was still absolutely baffled at the fact that he not only did did Jericho win this match, but the fact that he that he tapped out Tanahashi. Yeah. For um, I may not I may not watch every you know New Japan show in the world, but this is like one of the the first times I personally have seen Tanahashi like tap out to something, and so like that was that was something, um, you know it was it's almost like Hulk Hogan style levels of. Uh, of rarity when it when it, it comes to uh, Tanahashi tapping out, it was I was completely dumbfounded. Like, but by all means, I was absolutely happy with the result of the match. And yeah, you're you're right. The match was a bit slower pace, and it was quite interesting. And the way that they were using each other's uh, kind of maneuvers, and the way that Tanahashi kept doing the like the Jericho flex and that come on baby and yeah. stuff like that, like the the main games and even. Even the build-up when um, 
Tanahashi painted his face like uh, Jericho and was uh, playing with a band and all that. Like, like this, the this, the whole build up, the whole match was done really well, and uh, I just <laughs> I don't have anything else to say other than like this was arguably the I'd, I'd probably say this potentially would be my match of the night just in terms of the amount of enjoyability if that was a word um that they came out of it yeah definitely uh lots to enjoy with this match and uh you know, like you say if nothing else for the character work for for the for the poses uh and i know that jericho's had to rely a lot more and he's he's kind of uh, his banter with the cameraman, his banter with the fans and uh, all kind of the outside antics, which I think has really added to his character, considering, you know, he, he's not in his prime physically anymore. Um, but I, 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 as I said before, I think this is the best incarnation of Chris Jericho, in my opinion. But uh, it looks like uh, one of two things has happened. The Forbidden Portal is staying closed for now. But I certainly think I don't think we've seen the last of Chris Jericho versus uh, Tanahashi. I think that uh, there could be more more in the offing for these two somewhere down the line. I think Tanahashi's got to get his win back, uh, so it wouldn't surprise me if we see these two somewhere else on a Wrestle Kingdom, or who knows, an AEW card sometime in the future. Mm, uh, but so that, that. that would be that would be pretty exciting. Uh, but now we move... Well, as, uh, just before we, we move on... Yeah, what, go for it. Yeah, carry on. What um, commentary did you listen to? Uh, the American commentary. Um, so yeah, like halfway through the match, uh, the the commentary team got knocked. Like the I think they broke <laughs> the wh- whatever it was because the commentary team like disappeared for about five straight <laughs> minutes. And uh, it's a shame that doesn't happen more often on uh, the WWE broadcast. To be honest with you, especially when uh, you've got Michael Cole and Corey Graves. Uh, but, um, but but yeah, no, I, I did notice that, and they did kind of uh, acknowledge that fact on commentary when they were finally able to get their mics working again. But um, uh, yes, yeah, so... then, then they came back, and uh, Kevin Kelly also missed uh, quite a big spot where uh, Tanahashi low blowed Chris Jericho, and I just remember Kevin Kelly just screaming like, "I don't know, I didn't see what happened." The uh, the monitor went out again. <laughs> I think he was, uh, yeah, I don't know if he was just uh, kind of playing us there, but uh, yes, uh, that, that was an interesting little segment there. But um, yes, I, I, I'd love to see, I want to see more of Chris Jericho in New Japan and uh, definitely can't get enough of him with its New Japan or AEW as far as I'm concerned. Uh, but let's have a look at the, the main event then. It's for the IWGP, uh, two bouts really, the IWGP Intercontinental and World Heavyweight Championship. And the winner of this match will go out with, with all the gold, with uh, uh, two bouts. Um, it's, winner, uh, takes ca- winner takes all. Winner takes all. Kazuchika Okada versus uh, Tenseo Nato, and um, Nato, of course, picking up the IC strap the night before. Okada successfully defended his heavyweight championship against Ibushi from the night before. So this is a you know a historic match. And it starts with uh, Nato, very much the aggressor in this one, dropping Okada off the side of the ring apron with a with a draping neck breaker. That was a, a pretty brutal way to start the match. And Nato continues the offense working over Okada's neck with uh, big elbow strikes and, uh, and neck holds throughout the kind of opening uh, few minutes of this match. Okada gets uh, in a neck breaker of his own uh, before delivering a, a diving elbow. Uh, on the 15 minute mark, Nato hits a, a super runner uh, from the top turnbuckle. Okada strikes back with a shotgun drop kick, sending Nato hard into the corner. Okada then drop kicks Nato off the top turnbuckle in a very similar way to the way he dropped uh, drop kick to Bush off the top turnbuckle the night before. Uh, so uh, Nato goes over the top, down into the floor, down below, and uh, it, it seems like uh, Nato tweaks his knee or injures his knee here. Uh, Okada even drives Nato's injured knee down onto the announce table at ringside uh, with Nato just managing to beat the referee's 20 counts, and it was only just as well, because I think he stumbled on something like the, the 18 count and just managed to get in on like 19 and three They're quarters. They're really good at stuff uh, like that. Oh, man. It, it's like, uh, yes, it really <laughs> does add to the drama. There was an incredible poison Rana spot from the top rope uh, from NATO, uh, but uh, he still couldn't get the, get the job done. He still couldn't close down the match, even from that poison Rana. Uh, NATO nearly and probably should have had the match won from a, a brilliant Destino for a very close near fall. Um, Okada deploys his spinning Rainmaker. Okada then turns a Destino into a tombstone pile driver before connecting with another punishing Rainmaker, but Nato kicks out just before the three count. There's so many false finishes in this match, especially towards the end of this one. 
point, the match finally coming to a very dramatic nail-biting uh, finale with one final destino from NATO. And after the match, we see uh, NATO in much the same way as Moxley not really able to take in the win or celebrate. Kenta comes down to ambush NATO after this thrilling epic main event match um, and the final image on our TV screens Grizz was Kenta sitting cross-legged on the chest of NATO with both the IC belt and the heavyweight belt in his hands uh, almost certainly setting up uh, setting himself up as the next challenger for the championships versus NATO in the future but uh, it was it was it was an awesome main event. Um, I, I, I'm not quite sure how you would compare it to the main event from night one, uh, Okada versus Ibushi. It certainly was definitely up there and really dramatic. So many false finishes, so many close near falls, so much drama and action. And then to top it off, Kenta coming down and staking his claim to uh, to both belts. So give us your, your uh, two cents worth on the match and what we saw to close out the show. Well... <clears throat> It's this. This is the the one thing. Like every year, obviously, Wrestle Kingdom, fourth uh, of January. You know, only four days in the new year, and you already start the year off. Always, always, every year, with incredible matches. That you know, like, you know, we start off by saying like, oh yeah, that's that's a, a match of the year candidate, and it's not just purely because it's four days in the year. It's because these matches deserve to be in the conversation, and mm-hmm. you know, twelve months from now, like some of these matches probably will still be in the conversation, regardless of what happens between now and the end of December next year. Um, and I would, I would, I would probably ar- argue that um, you know the the Kotobushi Okada match from um, last night or yesterday morning for us was uh, maybe better but the the outcome of this match just uh I, I don't know that that really hit home a lot more for me because I was I was talking talking to my bud during the this match when I was like all all Naito wants to do is win the the heavyweight title in the main event of Wrestle Kingdom he's been trying it for years that's all he wants to do and you know what not only not only tonight did he do it but he walks away a double champion and just that aspect of the the story of this match was um, was just uh, incredible, just in in that way. And then we get the the, the bonus story of um, Kenta coming out and attacking and laying out Naito, and then doing the the Shibata cross legged um, yeah. set on the chest with the belt. It's just like I mean. There's only so much disrespect that you can give to one person. I think he gave him all of it. And yeah, Naito versus Kenta. Um, yes, please. Here's my money. Thank you. Yeah, most definitely. Now, when when Naito was the uh, uh, heavyweight champion, IWGP heavyweight champion, the first time round, the fans almost kind of rejected him as their champion. Um, that was a couple of years ago, though. I mean, times have changed. Naito's changed. Um, he's kind of developed a lot more as a performer. Uh, do you think he's going to be a popular IWGP heavyweight champion and intercontinental champion combined? Do you think uh, the fans are going to reject him for a second time? Or do you think because they've got such a hot heel challenger in the shape of Kenta, um, having done what he did at the end of Wrestle Kingdom 14 day two, do you think that now the fans are going to be on his on his side, unlike the first time round? I would argue that Naito has actually been ready for a couple of years now. Yeah. Um, Maybe that first time that he won it, I, I mean, personally, I was over the moon when he won it, and I was actually admittedly quite devastated when he lost it, like, what, like a month later? Mm-hmm. And then that's the only taste of the IWGP heavyweight title that he's had, and that was four years ago, maybe? Um, so I feel like, obviously, within that four years, um not only is Naito grown as a character and a wrestler, but Los Ungobernables as a stable have uh, very much grown. And I mean, back back in the day when Naito first won that belt, you know, the Bullet Club were the thing. They were the they were the, the they were the big shit in um, New Japan. And uh, let's say over the past couple of years, uh, Bullet Club have practically kind of fizzled out and they're just a bit of a wet fart on um new japan these days yeah um and los and have uh you know they've they've definitely taken over the top spot as the uh the top faction in the company so all of them like together in general 
I think, really also help uh, Naito in a way. Because like they, they all kind of rely on each other when it comes to uh, popularity. And needless to say, you see a lot more Los Angobanables shirts and hats and um, jackets and the like um, about now that used to be Bullet Club t-shirts. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I don't feel like... Uh, I feel like now... I think it was now or never uh, is pro- probably what I'd put it down to. If they weren't going to give Naito the belt today, which they did, and I am 100% behind that, uh, but if they didn't give him it, it today, I think maybe they missed the boat. But I think overall, this can only be nothing but good for New Japan, for Naito in general. You've got Kenta set up as your first challenger, which... Um, is going to be an amazing match, and all in all, this uh, this this can be nothing but good. And so I welcome it all wholeheartedly. Yeah, and going back to the top of the show where we asked about a uh, two-day Wrestle Kingdom, has it worked? I'd say when day two or morning two, night two, whatever you want to call it, Wrestle Kingdom fourteen closed this morning for us in the UK. Um, I think it was definitely a massive thumbs up and both days delivered. The show as a whole delivered. Uh, I think that, you know, the, the 70 plus thousand people that saw it over the two days in the Tokyo Dome uh, enjoyed their hell out of this. And I think the performers definitely delivered and coming out of it so much to digest i mean you've got so many new storylines um because of course new japan always essentially start their 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 new season um after wrestle kingdom like like wrestlemania's you know the following night on raw it's it's a brand new start a brand new series uh but uh yeah i mean not only do you have kind of a a new chapter started you've pretty much got an entirely new book uh starting coming out of uh, wrestle kingdom and going into new year dash uh tomorrow night with with uh, new champions across the board as well um I, i don't think there was a single championship that didn't change hands if I'm not mistaken and I think just about uh, well certainly most of them the majority of the titles that were up for grabs over the two days uh, changed hands um, over the course of these two days but uh, uh, what gives you your overall thoughts on Wrestle Kingdom 14 then Grizz I mean for me it's definitely a success I mean, I, I, I was more invested in um, some of the matches and some of the action from day one compared to day two I did love uh, the Jericho antics and the John Moxley match with Juice Robinson and Suzuki coming out and then the main events. But uh, day one, I think it had me leaping out of my chair uh, for, for more moments than uh, than I had on day two. But what about yourself? I mean, certainly overall from myself, it was a massive, massive thumbs up. Uh, sum up Wrestle Kingdom as a whole from yourself, Grizz. Um, for the most part, I, I wholeheartedly agree. I do believe that the uh, the two day thing works so much better. That we we got so much more out of these two shows than any one really long long ass show can do. Yes. And um, as we we, we kind of harped on earlier, the way that you know matches got time to breathe, they got time to really tell a story and not just feel kind of cut off like they have done in years past. So I'm hoping that this is the start of you know two day Wrestle Kingdoms because. They can do it. They show that they can do it. Maybe not every year will be um, a IWGP title versus Intercontinental title match, but you know you could uh, you could build up two like really intriguing storylines and have one main event day one and one main event day two, and you'll have two excellent main events coming out of it. Mm, definitely and it also gives uh, an opportunity for uh, more of the new japan talent to be involved over them two days more storylines to build more dramatic matches uh, but uh, yes uh, I, I, if you haven't seen any of uh, wrestle kingdom yet uh, wrestle kingdom 14 over the last two days go out and watch it subscribe to new japan world I mean, you, you can watch um, all the new japan action from just seven pounds a month um, and uh, definitely money money well spent but uh, grizz uh, that kind of brings us to the end of uh, this episode episode 92 of wrestling with john is our uh, day two wrestle kingdom 14 uh, recap uh, thank you so much for helping us out with this special episode sir well thanks for having us thank you for letting me talk to some uh, more chris jericho no, uh, you're, you're more than welcome, and uh, we, we'd love to have you back on the show sometime soon. But before we say goodbye, uh, do you have any any social media plugs, any any handles you want to throw out there, anything you want to promote while you're on the Wrestling with Jonas podcast? Um, well, it's been a it's been a podcasty couple of days uh, for for me to be honest. Uh, this is this will be the third podcast I've done in uh, about. Uh, less than tw- uh, forty eight hour period. Wow. Uh, so <laughs> I will. Uh, 
Currently, I will pimp out my uh, Robot Wars podcast, uh, or Robot Wars slash BattleBots podcast called Rise of the Robots, where uh, me and my co-host Alan, um, we sit down, we watch some Robot Wars um, or BattleBots, depending on where we are in the timeline, because we are we started at the start, we've done season one and two of uh, Robot Wars, we're uh, now on to the first proper season of BattleBots, um, so if... Um, if you remember uh, Robot Wars or BattleBots as a child and you want to come along for the ultimate nostalgia trip, um, it's uh, all the Robot Wars and BattleBots are on YouTube, so you can watch along with us and then come come along and then listen to the episode while we uh, we talk about it. Um, so that's Rise of the Robots and uh, Spotify. You can find us on uh, Audio Boom, uh, and now I'm, I'm pimping it anywhere I can. So. Yep, brilliant. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll all we'll all catch that. But uh, what I'll do is I'll uh, throw out your your Twitter and some of your social media um, handles in the description to this episode. So uh, yeah, a- anything else uh, w- w- you want to you want to pimp out uh, before we we say goodbye? Um, that's about it. Just uh, los ungovernables de Japón. There we go. But uh, thank you, Grizz. We look forward to having you back on the Wrestling with John's podcast sometime very soon, hopefully, in the very near future. But uh, as I, I mentioned at the top it. of the show, uh, no, you're very welcome. At the top of the show, I mentioned our new website, uh, wrestlingwithjohnners.com, where you can find everything Wrestling with Johnners related all in one place, including our full archive of, of podcasts, vlogs, uh, interviews. Our daily news updates, our uh, exclusive team of writers that uh, post articles on there on a regular basis, uh, and so much more. So go and check that out, wrestlingwithjohners.com, and you can find all of our social media links as well. So if you want to get in touch with us via Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, uh, or even email us, you can do. Just click on the links at the top of that page. So uh, please keep it tuned to the Wrestling with Jonas podcast for all of your weekly NXT and AEW updates. Our next episode, in, as a matter of fact, will be dropping uh, next Saturday. So in six days' time, we'll be doing a special preview for NXT UK TakeOver Blackpool 2, which is an event I'll be at. So not only will we be previewing nice. it on the Saturday, um, I'll be there present in the flesh, uh, watching it in Blackpool on the Sunday. And I think myself and uh, my uh, Wrestling With Jonas uh, cohort, Matt Bayliss, will be doing uh, possibly a, a slightly drunk uh, review or a, pre- uh, a, a recap show on the Sunday evening. Uh, but if we're too drunk, we might save it to the Monday morning. We'll see how no, that goes. No. <laughs> uh, but if you have enjoyed listening to this podcast, Please don't forget to spread the word. Tell your friends and tell your family. And don't forget to subscribe to the Wrestling With Jonas podcast so that you don't miss out on a single episode. But uh, from myself and from Grizz, thank you very much for listening. Catch up with you all again soon. Au revoir.